Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. Your writing does, almost of necessity, uh, reflect that interaction with other people. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. Hello, and welcome once again to The Emmett Blackwell Show. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. On this episode, I will be speaking with USA Today, New York Times, and Wall Street Journal best-selling author James Heyman. He has sold over a million copies of his McCabe and Savage thrillers. He is here to talk a little bit about each of them and how they relate to current events. We will also discuss how he began his writing career, his previous career paths, how he and his main character Detective Sergeant Mike McCabe are similar, and what he has planned for the future. Later in the show, we will test his Alfred Hitchcock trivia knowledge, so stay tuned for that. So, without any further ado, let's begin. Hello, James. How are you doing today? I'm doing terrifically. How are you? I'm doing great. So, um, when did you first discover that you had a writing gift? Um, I don't know that I could call it discovering I had a writing gift, but when I was just a little kid, six, seven years old, like that, I spent a lot of time in my bedroom with the door shut, making up stories. And looking back on that, uh, it suggests to me that uh, making up stories is what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, I never thought about I actually writing it uh, down until I got to high school. And my teachers praised my writing, even even on those times when I got a lousy grade on the papers they were grading. <laughs> uh, I remember one coat quote very specifically from my sophomore English teacher. Uh, He wrote, uh, and I think I pretty much quote the the comment on the paper. He said, rich, ripe American prose, very nicely written. Sadly, it lacks an idea, so you're going to get a C (laughs) minus. Well, it was, you know, that's something that's so shocking to you when you thought you were writing brilliantly to get the C (laughs) minus, but I remember it verbatim. Wow. Wow. Now, now you've been traditionally published with HarperCollins Publishing. Before you were, did you submit your manuscripts to other publishing houses? Well, what happened, actually, my first two books, The Cutting and The Chill Night, were originally published by St. Martin's Minotaur. Uh, the second one, The Chill of Night, didn't sell up to expectations, so I'm afraid St. Martin said bye-bye to me and didn't want to publish number three, which was titled Doctor- Darkness First. And uh, my agent was kind of saying to me, oh, dear, well, we may not be able to get anybody else. But she said she'd work on it. And somewhat to her surprise, Harper Collins really liked the book and uh, wanted to publish it. So uh, we went to Harper and uh, they published Darkness First. It did pretty well. And they went back and uh, both to my agent and my surprise, they approached St. Martin's and bought the rights to the first two books. Uh, the cutting and the chill of night, and they republished them uh, with much greater success than St. Martin's had had. Wow! And then uh, I went on to number four, the girl of the glass, uh, and that did that's the one that did well enough to make the Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the U.S. A to Day bestseller lists. Number five, Girl on a Bridge is currently selling very well, uh, and frankly, currently uh, I suspect it's partly due to an unintentionally timely plot subject because it tells the story of a 17-year-old girl who is raped in a college fraternity by a bunch of football players. Wow. And 12 years later, still suffering from PTSD, she sadly commits suicide. Uh, I don't get very graphic about the details in the book, and I handle it all as you know gently as I can. But mm-hmm. um, given all the stuff that's going on with Christine Blasey Ford and, and Kavanaugh and all that stuff for the last few weeks. I think that has really jacked up the sales of that book, which is very interesting to me because of the subject matter. Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah. uh, I won't provide these spoilers about what happens other than to say uh, 
uh, after she kills herself, two of the original rapers, rapists rather, are murdered. And that's what the mystery is. Mm. Who murdered the rapists? Intriguing. And intriguing for the times. Now, who has inspired you as an author? Um, well, I tend to, it's not so much who is what. Uh, I mean, there are authors that I sort of look to when I began to write my first book, and they include Michael Connolly, uh, his Harry Bosch books, and Ian Rankin, his John Rebus books. But I tend to make my plots about real issues, uh, which the book about the uh, college rape is one. Uh, but the background for my first book, The Cutting, uh, was inspired by having read some stuff about illegal organ transplants, which is what the book is about. The second one was peripherally about the sex scandal of the Catholic Church. Uh, and there's an ex-priest who suffered sexual abuse at the hands of uh, the grown-up priest when he was a child. Mm -hmm. uh, the third, Darkness First, was about the opioid e epidemic in northern Maine. So I, I do tend to write about current issues. I base my plots on those. And um, that's really the inspiration. Uh, I mean, I love certain writers like Scott Fitzgerald and Hemingway. And uh, among current writers, I love Kate Atkinson, and I like Tata French. But uh, uh, in terms of plot, uh, I go with, you know, what strikes me as an important issue for the times. Yeah, you kind of you kind of brought up a really good point. Is that you do kind of flow with the times, and I'm 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 assuming you probably have you know an office full of newspapers. The news is probably on all the time, um, and you're and you're getting these ideas from things that are happening. Do you think that, that helps your sales too? Just kind of staying up with current events. Yeah, that's a tough question to answer. I hope it does, uh, but I use the word hope. Uh, uh, very considerably, because there's really no way of knowing why people, uh, what motivates people to buy a book. A few, you know, a few of the reader reviews that you see say, oh, it's very interesting because we have, for example, a drug problem here in my state or my county or my whatever, and it gave me some insights into the opioid epidemic. Uh, but mostly it's hard to tell. Uh, it's just what is interesting me at the time, and I am I admit a bit of a news junkie. <laughs> now, before you became a full-time author, you had many jobs that seemed to lead you down a path to becoming a published author. What jobs or careers did you take on? Well, as I mentioned to you earlier, I got a job in an ad agency in New York, and I was writing uh, both print and television advertising. And over a few years, I moved to a couple of other agencies. And then I went to... Um, uh, an agency called Young and Rubicam, which at the time was, I think, the biggest in the world or number two in the world. And I stayed there for about 20 years and became one of their senior creative directors, one of their half dozen senior creative directors. And uh, uh, I wrote and supervised others writing both ads and TV commercials. And uh, I can say on the side that uh, writing advertising uh, is great trading for writing uh, suspense thrillers. <laughs> and I think, well, you can tell by the number of ex-ad writers who are uh, doing very well, most famous of whom is James Patterson, who worked for a long time at J. Walter Thompson and ended up as president of Thompson before he wrote his first best-selling novel. You think about it, somebody who has to sell ads to people, somebody who has come up with an ad, they're all about hooking their audience. And, you know, when you're a suspense writer or a thriller writer, you have to hook your reader. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then what other jobs did you have going on, too? Uh, I spent my entire career doing ad agency stuff. When I left the agency business, I did freelance writing for mostly financial institutions, but mostly marketing writing. And I wrote two nonfiction books uh, under contract. One was The History of the Biggest Bank in New England, which was at that point called uh, North Group, and uh, was since purchased by a bank called TD Bank. And I wrote another one about the biggest uh, hospital here in Maine, uh, Maine Medical Center. I wrote the history of Maine Medical Center, dating all the way back to the 1820s when basically there were no hospitals. Mm -hmm. So that, that was an interesting kind of writing, but I had always wanted to write fiction. 
and uh, frankly never had. And The Cutting, my first published novel, was literally the first fiction I ever wrote. Uh, and much to my amazement, I got an agent right away. I literally contacted one agent. She really liked the book and signed me on. And uh, she literally contacted six publishers and got two pretty good offers. Wow. Uh, one, for, one from St. Martin's and um, uh, one from another publisher whose name I won't mention. Wow. Well, that's that's pretty amazing. Now, the life of the big city, you spent the majority of, of your adult life in the big city with the ad agencies and things like that. And then you moved to Maine. What? How, how do you like living out in Maine rather than living in the big city? And is it more or less inspirational be, to be out there in Maine? Well, Portland, Maine, is, which is where I live, um, is an urban setting. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a very small city, but it's very urban in its feel. Uh, and I'm an urban guy. I'm not somebody who would uh, uh, fare well living off of the uh, way out in the booties. I mean, some people <laughs> love that. that. God bless them. Uh, but uh, that's really not my style. I like having good restaurants around. I like having good art around. I like having, you know, music and theater and all that stuff. And uh, Portland offers me all that on a very small scale compared to New York, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a very, for a small city in a, a small state, it's very sophisticated. It's very urban in its feel. Uh, it was recently, this is sort of interesting, Bon Appetit magazine voted Portland the foodiest city in America. Oh, sounds uh, like my kind of town. <laughs> Uh, because of all the good restaurants that mm -hmm. uh, that are here and uh, the number of restaurants. I think there's something like 250 restaurants in a city that has fewer than 100,000 people. A lot of them cater to tourists in the summer, admittedly, but it's, it's an urban place. It's got a police force that I could use in my books uh, that is uh, 160 members strong, so it's big enough so that they have all the necessary departments Yet it is also uh, small enough so that pretty much all the cops know all the other cops by name. Mm. And, uh, you know, unlike New York, where they have 50 different precincts and nobody knows anybody. But last book uh, was set in New York. I had my uh, hero come back to New York because his niece was uh, kidnapped and he felt that ob obliged to uh, become part of the search for her. And... Uh, so it's so uh, that's the first book out of Maine. Wow, that's it's I've interesting. Done. It's very interesting. Now, because of the character, I mean, you have this primary serial character, Detective Sergeant Mike McCabe. How are you alike, and how are you different than Detective Mike McCabe? Well, we're alike in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, on the surface level, we're both. You know, we were both born in New York. He was born in the Bronx. I was born in Brooklyn. We both grew up in the city, observing, uh, absorbing New York culture and how, you know, how New Yorkers think and how they do things. And New York's a very different city. Uh, you know, it has kind of a different mindset, but there are other things that are similar between us. Uh, uh, McCabe is kind of based on me. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, you know, He's a cop and I'm not, but we share what I would consider a similar moral compa uh, compass. We care about the victims. Uh, we're determined to see that justice is done and the villain, you know, the villain pay the price no matter what. Even if we have to occasionally break the rules, we're going to make sure that we get the bad guy. Um, also, it, it's, you know, in the first couple of books, uh, McCabe's girlfriend was a, an accomplished visual artist. Guess what? My wife for the last many, many years is an accomplished visual artist. So it was <laughs> simple to, you know, put that sort of art stuff into the books. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if any of your listeners are interested, she has a show currently up at the Jessup Library in Bar Harbor where a bunch of thriller writers, including me, at the end of the month, they're going up to to read at something called Murder by the Book. Mm, I think I have heard of something similar to that. That is yeah. very cool. That is very cool. Uh, it, it, it always seems to me 
like a lot of a lot of authors that I've met over the years, they look for people who are in other art aspects. And sometimes it's usually visual arts or musical arts. Um, you know, just to be able to surround yourself with that is amazing. And you know, congratulations! How long have you guys been married? Oh, you don't want to know. For over forty years. Wow. Man, congratulations. That is oh, amazing. Thank you. <laughs> that is a really good relationship. Now, um, have you ever thought, because I mean, you're such a newsy, right? And you sit there and you watch the news. You got, you know, Mike McCabe floating around your head all the time. Um, and you guys are so much alike. Have you ever thought about going into law enforcement or do you sit there and just kind of, you know, try to solve the mysteries that happen on the news all the time? Um, it has never once occurred to me. A, I'm probably much too much of a coward to go around carrying a gun <laughs> and facing people. Uh, I don't want to go to uh, uh, autopsies. I'd probably throw up every time. <laughs> um, and um, I'm interested in it as an, uh, and I'll call it an art form, because I do believe it is an art form. Um, some snobby writers might think, hmm, thriller's art, huh? But I think it is an art form. And uh, it's one that I enjoy partaking in. I don't think that being a cop would give me that same opportunity. Uh, for starters, I probably spend most of my day driving around in a car. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I would enjoy a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> So now you, you've given us little tidbits here and there about your most recent book. What, what is your most recent book and what's it about? Well, it's called A Fatal Obsession. And it is also about a, something uh, that is very currently in the news. Uh, you've heard of, I suspect, CTE, which is the uh, what football players get from repeated concussion, the brain damage that they suffer from repeated concussion. Mm -hmm. And the hero of this book, though we don't really learn it until the end, uh, this is probably a spoiler, but uh, suffers from CTE and it causes him to do the odd things that he does, one of which is kidnapping and presumably planning to kill Michael McCabe's young niece, Zoe McCabe, who is a successful young stage actress who the bad guy has sat in the audience for every performance of every show she's bidded and fantasized about her. And finally, he's kidnapped her. And uh, for McCabe, that makes it a very personal need to come to New York, uh, determined to get the son of a bitch before he can harm her or, God forbid, kill her. Mm -hmm. So in this book, in this uh, uh, fatal obsession, the stakes, the personal stakes uh for McCabe are probably higher than they ever have been before because this time it's about his family mm -hmm. and uh he's not going to give up looking for this guy wow until he's got him and whether or not it's too late to save his niece I won't say because again that would be a spoiler but uh, he's going to get this guy no matter what all right now, when it comes to writing a series of books, how do you add more to your characters of this, uh, as the story progresses? Uh, do you find, like, personal life events that have shaped your life kind of flow into, like, Mike McCabe's story? Uh, yes, I think you do. I think, you know, the oldest cliche in writing fiction is write what you know. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I will pick up things that have happened in my life and sort of weave them into McCabe's life or into some of the other characters' lives. Um, and I think most writers do that. Uh, I mean, uh, I suppose you could write about things that you've read about, but uh, you don't know them as, on a gut level uh, the way you know the things you've experienced yourself in terms of interactions with other people. And so when you're writing, I think that uh, your writing does almost of necessity uh, reflect that interaction with other people, if that's if that's what your question is. Yeah, it, it definitely. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Now, um, you, you are USA Today, a New York Times, and a Wall Street Journal best-selling author. Your McCabe and Savage thrillers combined have sold over a million copies. Now, do you ever feel the pressure of keeping up with your readers and what they want? Uh, I guess I do, but I think I I spend more time trying to figure out what I'm sort of pre-planning the next book, how to make it a little bit different, how to make it reflect something new, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, what my readers want is kind of interesting. But uh, when they tell me, and let's say you know you get up. 200 or 500 or 700 reviews on Amazon that you could read. And you get, but you get some sense from that of what your readers might want in the next book. But, but mostly there are, you know, some of them hate what you've done, but the majority tend to like what you've done and uh, uh, give you credit for that. Uh, yeah. It's- so I don't think you try to figure out what they want. You try to figure out what you as the writer want to write about and the kind of people that you as the writer want to write about. And in my case, the kind of issue that is important, like the rape issue and the uh, girl on the bridge or uh, the family issue uh, uh, with McCabe coming to New York to find the person who's kidnapped his niece or uh, the oxycontin, you know, opioid issue in my second book, third book. Uh so that's what that's the kind of thing I usually try to think about rather than gee what will the readers like this time mm-hmm. because I'm sure I'll guess wrong and they'll hate <laughs> whatever I do. Well, I mean it all, it almost sounds like you just write what you love writing and the readers will reply by either purchasing your book or not purchasing your book. So trying to listen too much to your readers might skew the way that a story in your mind should just go. You know, um, I've heard that from many authors that they write what they love, you know, and then I think, th- I think that's almost a necessity. You can't try to figure out the audience beforehand. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, you're invariably going to be wrong. I mean, some of them will like what you do. A lot of them will hate what you do. So I think the best, think for any writer, me or anybody else, is to do what feels right to you as a writer mm-hmm. and, um, you know, see how the audience reacts to it. And hopefully, in, in my case, at least uh, at least a majority of them reacted positively. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I don't know how else to go about it. I'm, I'm not going to do a survey of readers saying, gee, what would you like to be to write about next? Because I'll get all sorts of cockamamie answers and uh, uh, won't know what to do with them. Yeah, and then uh, poor Sergeant Mike McCabe might be on the moon next book. You never know. <laughs> it's entirely possible, but I'm no, I don't think he'd make a very good Neil Armstrong. <laughs> yeah. At least I wouldn't. <laughs> Although that's a new movie coming out now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Now, do you have any new books uh, coming through the pipeline? I am working on a book now that is, in fact, not a McCabe Savage book. Mm. I wanted to try something different, so I am into a book that is what will be a standalone because I'm not going to abandon McCabe and Savage. Uh, But I'll do this standalone, and then afterward, I've done six McCabe Savage books now. I'll do the standalone. Hopefully, it'll do well, although you never know. And uh, then I'll come back to McCabe and Savage if there is a call for it from my publisher and from, um, uh, from the readers. Hmm, I think there will be. I mean, I get so many uh, emails and uh, you know Amazon reviews saying how much they love the two characters and their relationships. So I think there's a there's a very positive feeling about them out there. Now, to be a USA Today, a New York Times, and a Wall Street Journal bestseller, who sold over a million copies of your books. Okay, now I'm I'm going to just throw this out there. You've put a lot of work into what you do, and uh, you are a professional, sir. So we would like to ask you, what advice would you give a brand new author who's just getting started, who's just starting to walk out and even think about submitting their manuscript anywhere? Uh, Well, I think the first thing they should do is let people they respect, uh, whether it's other writers or whether it's editors or whether it's just people they think are smart about books, read it. Read the read what they've written, comment uh, as you know uh, specifically as they're willing to do on what you've done well, what you've done wrong, uh, how you can make it better. Uh, take those comments to heart, particularly from the people you respect most, and uh, then rewrite your book. And then uh, then you have to look for an agent. Uh, as I say, I was extraordinarily lucky I got a very good agent first time out. That almost never happens, and it really was luck. 
Uh, I mean, I think the book was also good, had something to do with it. But really, uh, there are a lot of good books that have to go through 30 or 40 agents before they find one. Mm-hmm. Um, and the agents are so, so specialized. You know, they really are specialized now. Um, it's almost like if you're going to write a crime book, um, it's so segmented to the point to where you have a paranormal crime agent that works with only paranormal crime books, a different agent that might work with um, crime suspense, um, another one that works with forensic crime suspense. I mean, they're, they're all so segmented that finding one is not easy. It's really, you know, hitting the streets to find those people. Um, it's hitting the streets. It's asking your friends who have some experience in the business. Mm-hmm. It's also obviously uh, 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 literary marketplace, which is an annual – uh, uh, sort of encyclopedia uh, publishing houses and agents, which will give you a lot of information on what agents uh, want what kinds of books if they're currently accepting new manuscripts and uh, uh, where they're located and uh, uh, what authors that you know they represent, so you get some sense of how you know uh, legitimate they are and how successful they are. Um, and so that's worth going through, but uh, it's a it's a tedious and difficult process. I think the most important point about getting a good agent is writing a good book. And if you don't write a good book, even if you think it's good, it's going to be much much harder. You might get one, but uh, it's going to be much much harder. Do you have the talent for it? Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. Uh, uh, some people who have the talent don't get the breaks, but I think most people who do have the talent eventually break through and uh, get the agent they're looking for and hopefully get published. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Now, um, I have one more quick question. Um, would you like to participate in a trivia game, sir? I'll probably be terrible at it, uh, <laughs> but I'll try. <laughs> All right. As long as the trivia is probably set before 1980, I'll probably do pretty well. Oh, yes. This is... Classic, classic trivia. We have the Alfred Hitchcock trivia game, uh, the master himself. This is going to involve Alfred Hitchcock movies, actors, actresses. Are you ready, sir? Yes, I am. All right. Question one. Which movie has the last line, and they will say she wouldn't even hurt a fly? Oh, God. Uh that's a Hitchcock movie, and they will say she wouldn't even hear a fly. God, I have not the slightest idea. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That one was Psycho. That was Psycho. Apparently, at the very end, okay. that was the quote. So, here's the next question. You can redeem yourself. Bodega Bay was the location for which Hitchcock movie? Uh, the Birds? Yes, correct. Is that a good job? Is that right? Okay. Yes, it is correct. Okay, the next question. Who played the female leading character Josephine Conway McKenna in the movie The Man Who Knew Too Much? Doris Day. Yes, correct. All right. Next one. With the advent of talkie movies, a few years after his first directional outing, Hitchcock took full advantage and made his first talkie in 1929. What was the film title? Oh, gosh. Uh, that one you got me on, I think. Uh, it wasn't the 39 Steps, I don't think. Uh, what other early one did he have? Uh, the Man Who Knew Too Much. No, incorrect. It I'm was just guessing. It was Blackmail. I, yeah, I've never even heard of that one. Yeah, I know. Nobody's really heard of that one either. <laughs> okay, here's the next one. One of Hitchcock's first films to put him into the spotlight was The Man Who Knew Too Much. Released in 1934, it starred an actor who would later become more famous for his creepy roles in horror films. Who is he? Uh, Peter Lorre. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah, I think I saw it. Okay, the next one. A few years later, on came Shadow of a Doubt in 1943. It featured a favorite uncle, played by Joseph Cotton, who visits his family, but is actually on the run from the police. By what name do the police know him? Oh, gosh. That one I'm going to have to 
give up on to it. I have no idea. All right. It was Merry Widow Murderer. Ah. <laughs> I sort of remember the movie, but I certainly did not remember that nickname. I okay. know. Well, I think they mentioned it only like once or twice. The police were talking about it between them. Okay. Here's the next one. What was the first Alfred Hitchcock color movie? Well, that's interesting. Um, I'm going to guess, and this is purely a guess, North by Northwest. No, no, it was Rope. Okay. <laughs> yeah, got, got it wrong. That's okay, that's okay. You can redeem yourself at the end here. Which actor headlined Hitchcock's rear window? Well, that's Jimmy Stewart. That's yes, it was. Stuart. Jimmy Stewart, classic guy. All right, yeah. next one. What role does Paul Newman play in 1966 Torn Curtain? He plays a detective. No, I think it was a rocket scientist. Oh, was it? Okay. Well, I'm dead wrong on that one. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. All right. And now for the very last bonus question. This question is worth $2,926,000,000,000. Uh, <laughs> dollars. Dollars. No, it's not dollars. No, no, no. It's it's only points. You can't use the points for anything. <laughs> Get me in trouble with this points thing. All right, so here we go. The final question. The movie Spellbound opens with a quote from which author? William Shakespeare. Yes, correct. Correct. How did I know that? I know. How did you even guess? It's like two trillion some points. I don't know what you're going to do with those points. Uh, they aren't used for anything. You can't use them anywhere. But um, you won uh, the quiz, and uh, we do appreciate you being here on the show. Um, it was great, James, talking with you. Um, now, your books, you can find them all on Amazon. Is there any other place where people can find your books? Absolutely. They can find them certainly anywhere where ebooks are sold. They can find and order. Uh, if they don't find them in any bookstore in the country, they can certainly order them from any bookstore in the country. They may uh, luck into a bookstore in Topeka, Kansas that just happens to have a copy, but more likely they're going to have to go to the desk and say, I'd like to order a copy of James Haven's whatever, uh, A Fatal Obsession. But they will be able to do that, and the book will arrive in a day or two. All right. Thank you so much for being here on the show, James. It was a pleasure. It was a great pleasure for me as well, and it was fun talking to you. All right. And this is Emmett Blackwell signing out. Keep on reading and keep on writing, my friends. Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. Your writing does, almost of necessity, uh, reflect that interaction with other people. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. 